Greetings everybody, Russ Barkley here with a commentary on some comments that have been made in several interviews by the celebrity psychologist Jordan Peterson with regard to ADHD. Uh, I'm uh, wearing my Blackbeard Pirate t-shirt. I have a glass of wine, a little dangerous there, and I've just finished watching John Wick 4. So as my favorite blues singer Keb Moe would say, Look out, baby, I'm in a dangerous mood. Ordinarily, I don't do commentaries uh, or even write rebuttals to most of the nonsensical comments that are made in the media uh, or at conferences with regard to ADHD. There's just so many of them out there, you could spend your career trying to rebut all of these rather uh, idiotic comments that people make that are so scientifically illiterate and uninformed. Uh, so, you know, whether it comes from the Church of Scientology or their Citizens Commission on Human Rights or Tom Cruise or Peter Bragan or others who write books that are highly critical of ADHD, it, it really doesn't matter. I have decided I don't want to deal with those. But when someone of the status of Jordan Peterson, who is a retired professor emeritus of psychology from the University of Toronto, and clearly a celebrity psychologist who appears on many podcasts, including the ever popular Joe Rogan here in the US, and says such inane things about ADHD, I feel compelled to respond and to rebut these egregious comments about ADHD because, Jordan, they do harm. When you spread this level of misinformation about ADHD and people look at you and your, quote, expertise and your professorship in psychology and your PhD in clinical psychology, they assume you know what you're talking about. And it's very clear from the interviews that I have observed and will comment on this evening, that is not the case. You are not an expert on ADHD. It is as if I went into a time machine and went back 40 years to the 1980s to listen to these kinds of comments that are made about ADHD. So I'm not going to try to do what others on the left do and try to cancel your opportunity to speak. I'm going to do what people like me who are libertarians do and believe in free speech, and that is to rebut your comments because they have no scientific basis in our current understanding of ADHD. So here we go. The two interviews I'm talking about, there are probably others. Uh, the first is here on a YouTube website called Jordan B. Peterson Clips, uh, in which Jordan puts up an eight minute interview, apparently at some educators conference. It's not clear exactly when this was recorded, but these are some of the comments that he made and I'll talk about in just a moment. The second interview was done about six years ago uh, in 2017 at the University of British Columbia, where he was invited to speak by the Free Speech Club, in which he's also asked about ADHD. I'll put the links to these two videos if you wish to see them uh, in the thumbnail sketch that goes along with this commentary. Uh, but at this point, I don't wish to replay them. I had thought that I might show snippets of them and respond to them, but I, f I find them so nauseating that if I have to listen to this again, I think I'm going to need an anti-memetic, you know, some kind of maybe a stomach distress bag here in front of me to deal with what are clearly the most unscientifically founded statements about ADHD that could be easily refuted by anyone who takes the time to go to Google Scholar and looks at the research on ADHD, which clearly does, that was not done in response to these questions. So um, 
So if, if I seem animated about this, it's because I am, and it's because these kinds of comments by highly visible people who present themselves as experts in psychology and are asked to comment on something that they clearly know very little about is harmful to people who legitimately have this condition, struggle with it every day, and are trying to do the best they can in coping with it. So let's take a look at what Jordan had to say. I'm going to summarize it because, as I said, I can't bear to bring myself to show you these comments. Jordan Peterson believes that ADHD is rubbish. So we are going to dismember, dismantle the ignorant comments within these two interviews by Dr. Peterson as part of this brief presentation. Now, one of the things that Dr. Peterson says is that most people do not have ADHD. Well, yes, that's, that's almost a non sequitur. Of course, most people don't have ADHD. It occurs in about 7 or 8% of children and about 3 to 5% of adults. I think what he's saying here in labeling this clip is that most people with ADHD don't have a disorder of ADHD. Okay. So let's talk about that, because he then goes on to say, hedges his bets a little bit, that there might be rare cases of ADHD that exist out there that are a consequence of clearly documented brain damage. And the example he gives is that of fetal alcohol syndrome. So apparently, according to Dr. Peterson, if there's no obvious neurological evidence of a damaged brain, due to some, let's say, biohazard or trauma, then the ADHD is not a legitimate diagnosis. He therefore concludes that ADHD is a rubbish diagnosis, that it's a psychiatric fraud. It's as if Dr. Peterson has gone over to the views of the Church of Scientology, Tom Cruise and its Citizens Commission on Human Rights, because this is the kind of stuff that they say that this is a fraud. I mean, it's as if Jordan Peterson went through the several hundred thousand research papers on ADHD, had a set of criteria for what constitutes a mental disorder, and was able to weigh that evidence and reach some informed opinion that ADHD is rubbish, that it's a fraud, that it doesn't really exist. Well, it's very clear from Dr. Peterson's arguments in these interviews about ADHD, that he didn't do any such thing, that he has no criteria for what is a legitimate mental disorder or neurodevelopmental disability, that he didn't bother to go to the library, or in this case, get on the web, open Google Scholar, take a look at the several hundred thousand research papers, and come to an informed opinion about this matter. No, no. Dr. Peterson just comes out and says that this is rubbish. Well, that's great. So 250 years of medical commentary on ADHD by people who were sincerely trying to understand this condition in people, several hundred thousand research papers by experts in the world who are trying to really advance our knowledge of ADHD from a scientific perspective. None of this seems to matter to a celebrity like Dr. Peterson, who feels compelled to refer to this syndrome as rubbish. He goes on to say that most people diagnosed with this pseudo condition are boys. While that's true in childhood, that is not true by adolescence and adulthood, where more and more girls are coming in to be diagnosed as well. So, I mean, that's just clearly nonsense. This is not exclusively a male disorder. And then he goes on to cite the research of Jak Panksepp, more on that in a moment, claiming that this disruptive behavior, this ADHD, is the result of lack of play opportunities in childhood, that boys need rough and tumble play in order to develop adequate frontal lobes, in order to have adequate social self-regulation, and if they don't get that, they're going to develop ADHD. So the bottom line here is ADHD is due to limited or lack of play. 
This is based on the research of someone who I do know, who is Jak Panksepp, who was an animal researcher at Bowling Green when I did my dissertation there, and who was studying the behavior of rats and attempting to identify the nature of their play and the brain mechanisms related to play. And at some point, Dr. Panksepp concluded that the disruptive behavior of juvenile rats that were not allowed to have access to playing with their peers, they were raised in isolation, became somewhat disruptive and became more motivated to play with their peers than people who had not, or it's not people, but then rats who had not been raised in these austere, asocial environments. I mean, how this has anything to do with ADHD is beyond me. And there were times where Dr. Panksepp and I would correspond with each other after I left graduate school and I was developing theories of ADHD in which he would keep sending me some of these papers from some of his animal studies about couldn't ADHD be the result of problems with limited play? Because after all, in these juvenile rats, if you socially isolated them for weeks at a time and then let them free, they behaved in a very hyperactive, engaging, overly playful manner. And so therefore, the clinical condition in humans of ADHD might be due to a decrease in play opportunities that seems to be occurring in our culture. Now, mind you, this idea was floated out there about 45 years ago. And Dr. Peterson is reaching back that far for a single study to try to refute the legitimacy of ADHD as a neurodevelopmental disorder. I mean, this is pathetic scholarship. And consequently, I don't think Dr. Peterson knows that I know that research and that he doesn't get it right and that the claims that he makes about what took place in those research studies on juvenile rats is not quite correct. I'm not going to go into the nuances of that, only to say that if that's all you got, that is ridiculous. You are challenging the existence of a psychiatric and neurodevelopmental disorder on the basis of a 45-year-old study on juvenile rats. I mean, that's the equivalent of saying that ADHD children must have been duct taped in their bedroom for years at a time and not allowed to play with anybody or engage their family and that that's what led to their ADHD because that's what you're saying. They didn't have play opportunities. We can refute that argument very quickly. And that is what I said to Dr. Panksepp when he wrote me and said, what do you think about these ideas? And I said, number one, there is no research showing that children with ADHD, boys specifically, have a limited opportunity to engage in rough and tumble play. Oh, please. If anything, these children engage in more of that than other children because of their hyperactivity and inattentiveness and emotional reactivity and lack of self-regulation. So there's no evidence, first of all, to support the theory, the hypothesis. The second thing is that there are now several hundred studies of twins that immediately refute this idea. We can take your idea and take it out there and look at the empirical evidence. And twin studies are the best way to do that. Because in a twin study, we can calculate how much of the variation in a trait is the result of genetics and heritability, how much of that trait is the result of unique events that happen to that individual and not to siblings in their family, and how much of that trait is due to the rearing environment, things that siblings would have had in common. And that's where this play theory or hypothesis, not really a theory, would fall. It would fall in the shared environment factor in a twin study. Because if you're limiting play opportunities in a family, you wouldn't do it for just one of your children. You would do it for everybody. So when we look at these twin studies, they uniformly, reliably demonstrate the very same findings time and time again. What are those findings? 
The vast majority of variance in the human population in ADHD symptoms is a consequence of variation in genetics. The different genes that each of us have that accounts for differences in our height, our IQ, our personality, and so on, differences in genetics accounts for the vast majority of individual differences in people in level of ADHD. That is a fact in the bag. Those studies also demonstrate that a small percentage, perhaps 10 to 15 percent of that variation, might be the result of unique events that struck one child in that family and did not affect others. Such events could be things like pregnancy complications, birth complications, uh, low birth weight when you were born, uh, exposure to alcohol, as Dr. Peterson talks about, among many other factors, including head trauma, lead poisoning, and so on. Those things happen to one kid and not the others. And so we know that ADHD can arise in a very small set of cases as a consequence of non-genetic, non-shared, non-family events. So what's left? The shared environment, the family environment. How much variation in ADHD in the human population comes about as a result of family environment? Zero to 6%. Time and time again, every single twin study ever done demonstrates this finding. There is no more reliable finding in research on ADHD than this finding that rearing environment does not result in the variation in ADHD. 70 to 80% of that variation is genetic. The remainder is unique events. So right there, spells the death knell of this hypothesis of Dr. Peterson's that ADHD is due to lack of play opportunities. I mean, I just want to gag when I say that. That's how old this idea is. Nobody currently involved in ADHD research and hypotheses and theories cites that work of Dr. Panksepp's, except our Dr. Peterson in interviews when he is asked about ADHD. I mean, I just can't believe the stunning out-of-date commentary that took place here. So Dr. Peterson's views on ADHD are based on a 30 to 40 year old body of evidence on juvenile rats that were isolated from contact with other rats that led them to be more playful when they came out of isolation and to be more hyperactive as a result as well, and that that is the reason that ADHD exists. Boys just don't get enough rough and tumble play. Oh my God, makes me sick. So we have ADHD-like behaviors that are disruptive in boys in school. Dr. Peterson now says in these interviews, this is the result of the mind-numbing educational practices of our school system, which some in the audience clearly applauded. I mean, I don't know about you, but it, it appears to me that Dr. Peterson hasn't been in a school lately because I don't see restrictions on play opportunities in children. And if they were there, they would lead to ADHD and everybody in the school. They wouldn't lead to ADHD in just a limited number of children. Again, more evidence that this is simply a ludicrous, uninformed idea. He then talks about the fact that out there is this common belief that if you give a stimulant to someone with ADHD and they respond, it's diagnostic of ADHD because after all, the stimulant response is paradoxical. You wouldn't get that response in typical people. And of course, he goes on to say that this idea is simply wrong. Well, of course it is. We knew that 45 years ago. Jordan, where have you been? I mean, this is utter nonsense. Like I said, I feel like I got out of the hot tub way back time machine and went back to 1980. Nobody talks about the paradoxical response anymore who knows about ADHD research and psycho psychostimulant responding. But here we have Jordan reaching back over four decades 
to an idea that has been discredited and putting it out there right now as if this is what clinicians and researchers and other experts on ADHD currently believe. No, we don't. So the word for this, Jordan, isn't wrong, as you say in your interview. It's that you're woefully outdated in your knowledge about ADHD research. You go on to say that we are simply using amphetamines and Ritalin to mainly calm bored boys, as if that is the source of ADHD. Well, if that were the case, why aren't all boys in school who are bored by this mind-numbing curriculum, which, by the way, you graduated from, why aren't they all ADHD? Well, you try to account for that by going into personality theory about which you seem to know something, and you talk about extroversion and other aspects that might predispose children in one direction or another of disruptive behavior, none of which gets us back to the point. Uh, it's as if you're casting about for some kind of evidence to explain yourself. I don't know what you're doing here, but it clearly isn't science. So no, we are not giving amphetamines and Ritalin to bored boys just because of mind-numbing educational practices. Oh my God, this is so insulting to clinical practice that it doesn't deserve any further comment. Dr. Peterson then goes on to say that all of this is obvious that we're doing this because university students are using Ritalin like mad to help them study, which shows that it helps everyone. Well, we know that it helps everyone, not to the same degree. It clearly helps people with ADHD vastly more than it helps typical people because they're further from the mean in their behavior than are typical people. We know that. We've known it for 40 years. Give me a break. But to say that university students are using Ritalin like mad, on what basis do you say that? Research shows that we're looking at probably 15 to 25 percent of university students take these medications to try them once to see if they help them. They don't go back to them again. And only about 14 to 20 percent of them are ever taking it more repeatedly to help them study. And what do we know about these people? As I talked about in one of my research commentaries for last week's research already, we know that people who are illegally using prescription medicine for ADHD this way have a high probability of going on to substance use disorders for cocaine and methamphetamine. How many people is that? It's about 14% of the people in the study that I cited. So no. I'm sorry, Jordan, university students are not using Ritalin like mad to study. I mean, here again, this sounds like something I would read in the media, like the New York Times or something, but, but certainly not here, where you're supposed to be a scientist and a emeritus professor of psychology making these kinds of statements. So you go on to say that the solution isn't medication, but more engaging educational approaches, formats, curriculum, whatever. You don't really clarify that. And then that we need to have more opportunities for boys to play, play until they're exhausted, as he says in one of these interviews. Well, as I said, there's no evidence that ADHD children have had a lack of play. There's no evidence that they're juvenile rats who were locked up in a room for months at a time and didn't have a chance to play. There's no evidence that the mind-numbing curriculum of AD or, or of school results in ADHD. And certainly we don't see any evidence that families have restricted the play activities of the children within them who went on to have ADHD. I mean, none of what you were saying has any evidence apart from this 45-year-old panksep body of research on juvenile rats. I mean, that is just unfathomable. So you then go on to point out that because someone's hyperactive child has no trouble playing video games should tell us something about that there's not really ADHD or hyperactivity there. Well, we disabused people of that notion 30 years ago 
because we know that most children with ADHD can play video games because they have built-in continuous reinforcement schedules. And one sign that you may have a self-regulatory executive deficit is that you do well when the environment is providing a great deal of continuous reward for your engaging it, but you can't seem to get your work done when the environment doesn't do that, which is most of life. Most of life is scut work. And as a result, the ability to engage in sustained activity toward a goal in the absence of a reward is a classic demonstration of a self-regulatory executive frontal lobe difficulty. So this idea that video games are evidence against the disorder is a non-starter. You should know better. So consequently, the next time somebody interviews you about ADHD, please have the good sense to follow our principles of professional practice and admit the limits of your expertise and say, I don't know. Follow the advice of the novelist in Canada, Louise Penny, in her Three Pines novels with Inspector Gamache, who teaches his minions to say, I don't know, to be humble, to admit when this is not your area of expertise, which clearly ADHD is not. So I'm sorry for the level of emotion and passion at this point, but Dr. Peterson has attempted to throw away 250 years of medical commentary nearly 2 million citations on ADHD in Google Scholar, hundreds of thousands of research papers, not to mention my 45-year career and several hundred research publications on ADHD by just dismissing it as this fraud of psychiatry that is rubbish and that arises purely because little boys aren't allowed to play. That's insulting. So please, next time, show some humility. Thank you.